Hey guys, uh, welcome back. Um, so we're on uh, episode two of our uh, Neon Vector tutorial uh, here now. Uh, so um, if you haven't seen uh, the first episode, which goes through the first part of this tutorial, uh, make sure you go and check that out first. I'll put the link up here um, and in the description down the bottom as well. All right, so uh, this video is not gonna cover the whole um, second part of the Neon Vector tutorial. Um, we are just going to focus mainly on just this bit here. So just the enemies. So it's going to be pretty cool. We're going to be able to add in a few enemies um, and then program them to do different behaviors and things. Um, so we're doing all the way, we're going all the way up to here, just before our collision detection starts. Alright, so we're hoping to end up uh, with uh, the ability to spawn uh, two different enemies, so the Wanderer and the Seeker. Well, the Seeker is going to be an enemy that follows the player around, and the Wanderer is going to move around randomly. Alright, so um, if you're following along with the tutorial, um, first thing I want to talk about is a couple of uh, gotchas. So, uh, the first of which is uh, the Scale 2. So, oh, sorry, let's bring that back up. So as you, if you're following along um, and you get to uh, this bit where you're defining the enumerable for the follow player uh, enemy behavior, you'll run into this bit where he's got uh, dot scale two, and these two, these this will return this little bit of code in the brackets is going to return a vector two uh, object, um, and then you're calling the scale two. Uh, ve uh, method, right, for the vector2 object, and that doesn't actually exist uh, by default uh, in the mono game vector2, and that's actually an extension uh, that you need to add into your uh, extensions class. So if you've been following along from um, episode 1, you should already have an extensions.cs in your project, um, and you would have the two angle and the next float for your randoms, um, but you won't have scale 2 yet uh, up to this point in the tutorial. So uh, this is it here. So make sure uh, you, you put that in. Um, otherwise your, uh, your project's not going to build. Alright, so all right. So the next gotcha that you want to look out for if you're following along is um, the random uh, behavior. So the other behavior that you're putting in in the enemy class here is the... Uh, move randomly behavior for your enemies. So when you, you're in here, uh, the author has also put in this rand.next float. Now it's not the extension, so it's because you should have a next float for your uh, random in your extensions class. It's this rand here. Now it's a pretty obvious one. Uh, all you have to do to fix that is make sure you create the random object and call it rand uh, right at the start in your uh, initialization of the enemy entity class. So, where have I put it? Yeah, so right here. Um, so you just need to have that line, uh, random rand equals new random. So you have a new random object stored in this rand variable and ready to go and ready to use. Okay, so those are the two little gotchas um, in the tutorial. There, now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, a couple of the uh, interesting bits so if you're following along and you um, and you you just want to know uh, how do I get this working for Modern Games instead of XNA, uh, that, that's that's pretty much it. Um, everything else uh, you can follow along with the tutorial. But if you want to know a little bit more about uh, these three other topics, um, the first one is enumerables and enumerators. They're quite a unique little uh, structure, uh, which I'll talk about now. And um, the other mechanic that we've got is this uh, fade in. Um, and the, the last one is uh, how velocity works in this um, implementation. Okay, so first of all, enumerables and uh, enumerators, right? If you don't know what they are, just briefly, uh, an enumerable is kind of like, is the, is, can be thought of as the object, uh, as the class blueprint for the enumerator. So the enumerator is like an instance of the enumerable, okay? And the benefit that you get with these enumerables is you can 
run through a bit of code until it runs to the yield section and then it'll exit out of that bit of code and then you can do other things, right? Like run the rest of your update loop and then the next time you you want to execute the um, enumerable or the enumerator of the enumerable, you can jump back into that code and it'll continue processing code um, from the last place you left off. So in this case, if we have a look at the follow player, uh, we've got everything in this while loop and then it returns um, with this yield return zero, right? So the first time it runs, it'll execute all of this code, then exit out and then you run the rest of your update loop and then you'll come back in and then run this again until it hits the yield loop. And that's how we get the behavior to recalculate every time for the enemies. And we can sort of make this as complex as we want really. So I, every update loop I can check what's the player doing and, and then I'll have code that reacts to um, those variables as they change, as the environment changes. Okay, so that's um, that's enumerables and enumerators. Um, if you want, I've, I've spoken about this in way more detail in a whole separate video because there was something that I was not familiar with either. Um, and I'll put a link for that up now and in the description as well. So I, I talk about it for like 20 minutes. <laughs> so if you want to get bored, um, definitely jump over to that. Or if you want to you know, get a better understanding, I, I've, I've put in code examples and stuff like that to simplify it down. Okay, so um, the next part one I want to talk about is how we've got uh, the spawning of enemies uh, sort of delayed initially because we want to have the enemies slowly fade in, give the player a little bit of a warning before they start moving around, right? Or if later on if they start shooting or something. So um, if you have a look up here, I've got an, a time until start variable. Now that's in the uh, tutorial. And uh, I, because I've implemented my update loops a little bit uh, differently to the tutorial, I'm using variable time steps. I've got uh, inactive time set to one and a half seconds. Um, now I use this inactive time uh, over here. Uh, sorry, over here, time until start and inactive time. Because at the start, we've got time as will start equals inactive time. And that's sort of a timer that I've got running up at the time that the enemy is created and it has to run down to zero um, before we start applying behaviors, right? Before they start moving and doing other things. So um, the interesting thing here is as they are stationary and spawning in slowly, um, in the tutorial, he's told us to, uh, showed us how to put in a fade in time. So what this number, this mass here returns is as we're looping through the game, going through the update loops, uh, we're multiplying um, the color dot white uh, by a fraction. And as we multiply it, say we multiply it by 0 0.5, we're putting a 0 0.5 or 50% opacity onto the um, color dot white property here. And you can see um, at spawn time, color is transparent, so the enemy starts off completely invisible, and then this number slowly increases over the course of one and a half seconds, or my inactive time here, um, and slowly increases from 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, so 20% opacity, 30% opacity, 30, uh, 40% all the way up to 100%, and when the enemy is completely visible, and by the time he's completely invisible, um, that's when he, completely visible, sorry, that's when he's gonna be able to start moving. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty interesting one there, I thought. Uh, I didn't know I could reduce opacity of a color um, just by multiplying it by a fraction. Um, so that's that information there. Um, and the last one is, uh, yeah, so this is an interesting one. If you're familiar with making games, and I've seen this done lots of, in lots of other tutorials um, for making games, uh, it's how he's implemented speed. So the, the idea here is we want enemies to slowly increase their speed until they've reached their maximum velocity. They don't, I don't want them to, we don't want them basically to just start at going like 500 pixels per second um, from zero, right? We want them to slowly increase their speed. 
So um, the way we've implemented it is he's got a, a um, some friction here to simulate friction as the um, enemy moves at a faster and faster pace. Uh, the effect of friction increases until he's reached a terminal velocity or a maximum speed. Okay, so so that's the friction. That's where friction is being applied basically after every update cycle. But um, if I look down at the uh, follow player behavior right here, um, what we're doing here is adding in a constant acceleration. So every update loop that goes through, we're adding in say 30 pixels per second or 30 pixels per loop. Okay, so that acceleration keeps increasing really quickly at first until the uh, friction uh, starts to affect it and it starts to sort of curve out. Now, I'll show you how this works. Uh, the best way to do it is in an Excel sheet, I think, and then chart out the resulting velocity. This is how I sort of wrap my head around it as well. Okay, so in this left column here, I'm gonna have acceleration, acceleration, uh, in here we'll have friction and then in this third column it's going to be the resulting velocity so the speed right okay so first when the uh, enemy is spawning in it's going to be a zero acceleration we're not applying any acceleration in right no no behaviors are being uh, put in um, next we've got friction which we have 0 0.9 Okay, so we're taking away 10% every update. And then the resulting velocity is, at the moment is going to be zero because we're just going zero times and applying friction. And we've got zero velocity because there's no acceleration. Now, if we start applying some acceleration, let's just say put 30 pixels per update cycle. All right. Um, and we're going to have that acceleration constant throughout. Let's go to about there. Same with friction, okay? Friction is going to be constant throughout as well. So it's just 0 0.9 of acceleration. Now, the resulting velocity uh, after every update cycle, we're going to keep adding 30 pixels per second to velocity, and we're going to keep applying that 10% uh, reduced speed uh, via friction every, every update cycle. So this is going to be equal to its previous velocity, plus the new the difference in speed which is acceleration right multiplied by friction here now I'm just going to wrap these guys up in brackets so you don't have any funny uh, maths coming out and we can see after the first update cycle we're moving at 27 pixels per update cycle now if we keep carrying that on through you see that initially he's speeding up very quickly and then at some point around 230 240 pixels per update cycle it starts to flatten out and that's because the friction is starting to overtake that 30 uh, pixels per update cycle speed so I mean you might be able to see it from here now but uh, let's uh, let's just put that into a graph uh, how do I do this <laughs> use accelerate on Delete that and insert graph. All right, here we go. So if we have a look at this chart here that we've created, you can see initially we're speeding up very quickly until we reach about 250 and then we start to flatten out. And we're going to see that a little bit better if we just uh, increase this. We'll just increase all of these. A couple more update cycles in there. And we'll also apply that to our charts until we get a real nice looking curve there. All right, you see this? This is, this is beautiful. <laughs> okay, so you can see very clearly that we keep speeding up, keep speeding up, keep speeding up uh, in a nice smooth fashion until we've reached a maximum velocity where friction is starting to overtake our acceleration. And that's how we get that slow increase in speed, right? Um, now, if we didn't have friction, say that was just one, right? So there's no, no affecting friction. And we just do put that through all the update cycles. What do you think is going to happen? It's 
just a straight line, right? So we're just increasing acceleration, just keep increasing it into infinity and that enemy is going to be moving at an infinite speed. <laughs> so we need to restrict it somehow and then we're doing that with friction. And I think that's a, a really nice way to um, implement the movement on your enemies. There you go. Okay, so uh, lastly, um, so after you've written up all your tutorial and your, uh, all the code and tutorial, um, I also like to test my code and I, I wanted to test the enemies after I'd done them, even though in the tutorial it doesn't tell you to do it. Um, if you want to do the same, uh, what I've done is, because we've already created, um, uh, let's have a look at the enemy class again first. We, in, in the tutorial code, he's also shown you how to create the uh, enemy spawner factories, the enemy factories. Um, and we make them public methods so that we can create a seeker at any position in the um, in the game. And the way I've done that is then gone into my game root and then under the initialize where the player is spawned. Also, if you go ahead and spawn an enemy or multiple enemies, so if I wanted to spawn the seeker, I would just go entity manager and add, add. Uh, so from the entity manager, we've already got this add function. And we're going to add the uh, create an enemy and add that to the uh, entity manager. And that's all you got to do because you've already done all the hard work in the first part, right? So um, let's see how this runs. All right, and there you go. See, we've got the follow. Um, player behavior being uh, executed on that seeker enemy and if I wanted to I could go ahead and test out the wanderer enemy as well so let's have a look at the enemy wanderer and we've got the add behavior the move randomly behavior so if you have a look at move randomly we've got some maths to um, just move the that thing in a random direction um, and then when it gets to an edge um, we go ahead and point it in, a, in the direction away from that edge and uh, yeah so let's have a look at that so we're going to go create wanderer and we'll spawn him in the same position at 200 200 let's save that and just give that a quick whirl and we've got that wanderer enemy now and we're testing him out so that's pretty cool. Um, now I'm probably going to go ahead as well and just mess around and add a few more different enemies or uh, what you can do is just mess around here. You, can, you don't have to just have one. You can see what it looks like when there's heaps of wanderers maybe. I'll just run that just to have a crack. All right, and there you go. They're all, <laughs> they're all piled on top of each other. Looks like it's not quite random, is it? <laughs> but yeah, anyway. Okay, so um, thanks for watching, guys. Um, what I'll do is uh, put a link to the GitHub uh, of uh, what I'm up to so far um, uh, down in the description um, and maybe in the link up there now. Uh, so you can go ahead and download uh, what I've written. So I've, I've also um, put in way more comments than are really necessary uh, all throughout my code just to help myself and you guys hopefully as well understand what's happening uh, in the tutorial although he does a great job of explaining i just sort of go in a little bit more in the code um, so yep uh, next video we're going to be talking about uh, collision and um, i think that's that's going to be an interesting one as well uh, traditionally collisions uh, a bit of a tricky thing if you're doing it for the first time so um, yeah, thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you in the next episode.